I'm Emily. Um, I'm a core developer on Meteor, as Rico said. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and today, I'm going to be telling you all about Meteor and also showing you about it. So a few of you, it sounds like you'd heard of Meteor. I've talked to some people who have used it, who are even using it for their, for their companies. Um, if you haven't heard of Meteor, let me tell you a little bit about what it is. Basically, Meteor is a, a set of client, uh, command line tools, like a build tool, and a set of packages. And together, these make up a platform for basically developing really, really cool web apps. So what's a cool web app? Well, what we mean is something that is very interactive, real time, very fast, and has a really rich, snappy user experience. And our goal is to make it really easy for developers to build these apps very quickly. So in this talk, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about what makes Meteor different, and more generally, what web apps are looking like these days, which is different from traditional apps that you might have built in Rails or Django. Uh, and then I'm going to spend most of the time doing a live coding demo. So I'm going to go through building a simple app. And hopefully, if you have already maybe seen, seen Meteor, played around with it a little bit, uh, I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit of new, um, new knowledge because I'm going to try to, as I go through each feature, explain what's going on under the hood. A lot of times people say Meteor is too much magic. I don't know what's going on. Um, and I'm going to try to explain what's going on because I swear it's not magic. So let me start by telling you what a Meteor app looks like. And I'm going to do that by comparing to a traditional request response style app. So this request response style is where the client says, hey, server, I want a list of sea creatures. And the server says, these are the sea creatures that I know about right now, and here's the HTML to display them. And that's all the browser knows how to do, is go make a request, get a response, and, and display that response on the page. In a Meteor app, we want to subscribe to data. We want to say, I want to know about all the sea creatures that the server knows about. And when the server finds out about new sea creatures, then I want to know about those also. And when the client finds out about new data from the server, the client figures out how to put it on the page instead of the server saying, here's all the HTML for the entire list. And of course, it's not just Meteor apps that are doing this. This is, this is a very common style of web development today. You might have used something like servers and events or web sockets to constantly stream data from the server to the client. Client-side rendering is a very common thing. Uh, but what we try to do in Meteor is make it very easy and quick to develop these kinds of apps and make it so that you can bake these features in from the very beginning. So these are some of the principles that, that we have that describe this kind of app and that, that uh, inform how Meteor works. Data on the wire means we send data from the server to the client. We don't generally send these huge blobs of HTML. Client-side rendering, I mentioned, the client is the one who knows how to, how to render the templates. It's not that the server has a template and the server renders that template with some data. Instead, the client has the template, and the client figures out how to do the rendering and how to react to data as it comes from the server. Another difference is when you start writing data. So when you start making changes to data on the server, in a traditional request response style app, you generally send an HTTP POST request where you say, this is the new creature I want to add. And the server goes off and does some work, maybe writes to the database, and then it comes back and it says, OK, I added that. And here's the updated HTML with, with your new creature in it. In a Meteor app, we have a little bit of an advantage. As I mentioned, the client, uh, the client subscribes to data over time. And that means that the client has this in-memory local cache of the data that it knows about. So when the client wants to go make a change to that data, instead of going to the server and saying, I want to make this change, tell me what the result is, the client can just do it locally. The client can just update its local cache and then go update the page, uh, do whatever it needs to do to reflect that change while sending the message to the server and when the server comes back and says, OK, everything went according to plan, the client has successfully predicted everything that it was going to do, and it doesn't need to do anything else. And Meteor takes care of all of this for you, as you'll see when I do my demo. And so we call this latency compensation. 
we're compensating for the latency of going back and forth to the server by just predicting what the server is going to do and, and acting accordingly. And only if something goes wrong on the server, like if the server comes back and says, you're not authorized to do that, or I, I threw an exception, I don't know what you're talking about, then Meteor figures out how to undo the changes that were applied locally and match what actually happened on the server. One final point of comparison I want to make before I get into my demo is that we see a lot of developers building these kinds of apps that behave a lot like Meteor apps. But they often do it by putting together tons of different tools. So you might use uh, any one of a number of front-end front -end JavaScript libraries in addition to your, your CSS framework. You might pick some different technology on the server, different framework, different actual uh, application server. You might want to use something like SockJS to, uh, to, to use WebSockets, even in browsers that don't support it. In Meteor, our philosophy is that it's much easier to do it all. We're, we're a little bit more of an opinionated framework. We, we want it, we want it it to be as easy as possible for you. And so we try to make the hard decisions for you and give you one stack. So by default, you write your entire app in JavaScript, server code, client code. And that means you can share a lot of code from the client and the server. And you can use the same APIs on the client on, in the server, um, except where it doesn't make sense. And I'll give you some examples of that. But we also don't want to tie you down. So when, when you want to go hook up your Meteor app to an Objective-C client, we have a protocol that we use to transfer data from the client and the server. And you can implement a client in, in Python or Objective-C. Or you can take your Meteor, your Meteor app and hook it up to a Java server. And we have community members who are doing these things. And I think we'll only see more of that as time goes on. All right, so now it's time for my demo. And um, so I'm going to go through the process of building a simple app. Um, I went to the Hobbit house last night instead of practicing, so it's your job to find typos. And um, where is my... There we go. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start with an app. I have a little bit of scaffolding already set up here, but not, not too much. Um, we're inside a Meteor app. Uh, if we weren't already here, we would create an app by... by typing Meteor Create and the name of our app. Can everyone see OK? OK. Um, and what's in here is an HTML file where I have just a little bit of starter code. And, um, and, and in every Meteor app, you have a Meteor directory, which has things like the packages that you're using and the release of Meteor that this app is pinned to. So let's look at this HTML. So I have this file open. Um, it's, it's written in mostly HTML, and it has some handlebar syntax. So we use a template language similar to handlebars, which you might have heard of yesterday, described as like the son of Satan or something. But um, so it's OK. Um, so, so we have two templates here. Um, we have a header, which is just a header, not, not too. Um, Oh, and by the way, this is like not a politically correct app. People's feelings are going to get hurt once I deploy this. But um, so, so we, have, we have this header. Um, and then we have a list of talks. So what we're going to do is iterate over the talks. And for each talk, we just print the title and the speaker and the number of votes. So right now, this is just a template. We don't have any JavaScript code yet. We don't have any data here. We're not, this is not going to do anything. So let's write some JavaScript. Uh, this file's not supposed to exist. All right. Good? Maybe a little big. <laughs> okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is declare a collection. So if you've used MongoDB before, this is the syntax we're using. And Meteor right now only supports MongoDB, but there are plans to support other databases, um, including SQL databases in the future. So we're declaring this collection. And we're actually writing code. This line of code is going to run on both the client and the server. So when this code runs on the server, it actually creates a Mongo collection. And when you read and write to this collection, it actually talks to Mongo. On the client, we're declaring a local in-memory cache of this collection. Now let's write some code that just runs on the server. 
And later, we'll write some code that just runs on the client. So on the server, we want to publish this data, just as I showed in our picture. So we're writing a publish function. And what we're doing here is we're taking the result, we're taking a database cursor, which is sort of like an abstraction representing a query, but not representing the actual results of the query at any particular time. And we're basically returning this as, our, as the result of our publish function. Now on the client, we're going to subscribe to this. So what this means is that our server is publishing everything in its tox collection, and the client is subscribing to that data and storing it in its own tox collection. Um, OK, so we have, we have some data being published. One more thing before our app actually does something is that we want to actually declare, uh, define that template helper that we used in our template. So when we're, when we're iterating over that list of talks, we need to actually have the talks to iterate. All right, so I have some dummy data in the database. So, um, so let's go run this app. And the way we do this is, I was totally going to do an OK Meteor run joke, but I feel like that was used up already. So <laughs> OK, so this is how you actually run it. Um, and then we can go, so we're running a local development server now, and now we can go look at our app. Um, did I get rid of my, let me see. I might have gotten rid of my sample data. So another thing we can do is open up a Mongo shell. Um, and this is a, a Mongo shell to the database that our app is, our app is um, running. OK, so I don't have anything in the database. Let's go put something in. Um, I think I have some sample data somewhere. OK, so now we should have something in our database. And in a second, OK, so now we have our, so now we have our, um, we have our talks. Can everyone read it? It looks good? OK, I'll take that as a yes. OK, so we have some stuff in the database. We've, we've published, we've subscribed. Um, OK, so what's going on? I haven't showed too much yet, but before I go further, let me explain how this pub sub thing is working. So it's actually kind of embarrassing. Um, what we do right now is when, you, when, when the server publishes some data and then some write happens, like you go use a Meteor API to write to the database, the server actually goes and pulls Mongo for all the queries that clients have subscribed to. And then it takes, the, it takes the data that it's already sent to the clients and diffs that with the new result of the query. So it's computationally expensive. Uh, it's expensive in memory. Um, but it's actually gotten us quite far. There are a few optimizations that work really well, like deduplicating queries, because a lot of times the same clients subscribe to, to one query and not the, all their own queries. But we actually have something really cool and exciting coming out fairly soon. There's actually a preview release. Um, if you really want to try the, the hot off the press stuff, there's a preview release with something called oplog tailing. And this is a much more scalable mechanism for doing pub sub where the Meteor server is actually going to act as a secondary in a Mongo replica set. So the Meteor server is going to tail the oplog, which is the Mongo log of all the operations that are happening on the primary. And it can tail that to figure out which queries uh, that, that clients need to be updated. So it's much less memory intensive, and it's much less computationally intensive. Um, we're still you know, gathering information about how it's going to work in real apps. But so, so far, the benchmarks are looking really good. So that'll be a, that'll be a, a release in the near future. All right, let's make this app do something. I'm going to give it some upvote and downvote buttons. So first, let's just do the HTML. So this, we're, we're, we're rendering a talk. Let's put in a button. And a downvote button. And so these should show up now on our, on our page. 
Okay. Uh, one little thing I want to point out is the hot code push. I don't know if you caught that, but I didn't refresh the page. The Meteor server detects when code has changed, and it, autom it tells clients to refresh and get the new code. Um, okay, so we have our buttons, but of course they don't do anything yet. Meteor is not that much magic. We didn't write any code to actually do something yet, so let's write that code. So we, have, we need events for our upvote and downvote buttons. So we'll go into our JavaScript and define an event like so. So this is called an event map, and we say when you click on an upvote button, we're going to do, uh, we're going to call what's called a meteor method. So we're calling the upvote method, and we're passing it the ID of the talk, which is the talk we're currently iterating over. That's what goes into the, the, the this keyword. And we'll do the same thing for downvote. OK, so I've defined these, these event handlers. And now we need to write these actual methods. So I'll define them here. And this is just a function that takes the ID of the talk and upvotes it. Okay, sorry, I went off the, here, let me do that so it's a little easier to see. So that's simple enough. And we do the exact same thing for downvoting. Well, not the exact same thing. So this is our method, and we can call it from the client. You can also pass objects. Meteor does a lot of serialization and deserialization for you. So you can, you can pass any, any object that can be serialized um, approximately with JSON. OK, so let's see what happens. I'm going to do one more thing before I run this, which is I'm going to change my template to actually um, to sort by votes. OK, so this means our list should be sorted by votes. All right, fingers crossed that I didn't make a typo. We should now be able to upvote. Yeah, OK. So notice that I did not write any code to actually go update the page to change the number of votes. And if we upvote this one, it reorders. I didn't write any code to reorder the list. This is what the reactivity is all about. Meteor is just reacting to the changes in the data and automatically re-rendering the parts of the template that are relevant. And of course, this is all persistent, so I just refreshed the page. This is actually writing in the database on the server. So let me show the code again. And this is usually the point where people start saying, this is too much magic. I don't understand what's going on. So I'm going to tell you about a package called Depths. And this is a fairly small package in the Meteor core. It's about 500 lines of code. And it's how all this is implemented. It's a simple dependency tracking system. So when we render this template the first time, we construct this, this, this database cursor. When this cursor is constructed, it says to Meteor, to this depths package, it says, hey, Meteor, any current computation that's running depends on me. It's running. It called me. It depends on me. When I say that I changed, you have to go rerun that computation. Then sometime later on, the client gets some new data from the server. And the client says, oh, that's, that goes in this query. That, that affects this query. At that point, the database cursor says, hey, Meteor, I changed. You have to go rerun all the computations that depended on me. In this case, that computation is this part of the template rendering. So this is actually a really simple, easy to understand idea, even though it seems kind of magical when you first see it. But you can go read this depths package. It's used to implement um, reactive templates. It's used to implement um, reactive, different reactive data sources, like database queries and, and even just plain reactive variables on the client. So if you're interested, it's very accessible. And I, I think you should check it out. OK, so we can upvote and downvote. Um, Another thing we can do is actually do this from multiple tabs. So this is not just you know, something that's happening within this tab. We can go to a different tab that doesn't share any state with this one. And changes from this one are automatically reflected in the other one, um, and reordering, and et cetera. And we didn't write any code to do that. Meteor does that all for us. If you were watching closely, you might have seen 
that I actually define these methods on both the client and the server. So I didn't, I could have put this code inside our is server block, but I actually put it in, in, the, in the top level where it runs on both the client and the server. But it's sort of weird because these are the server methods. That, what, what is the client doing running the logic that we want to happen on the server? So this is the latency compensation I was talking about. With the same code, we've defined both the method on the server and we've defined what's called the client stub, which is the way that the client simulates the method locally. So when, the client, when you click the upvote button, the, the client immediately sends a message to the server saying, I'm calling the upvote method. At the same time, the client goes and runs this code where it actually updates its local in-memory collection, and that causes the page to re-render and all that. So what this means is that the client is simulating the effects while the method's actually being run on the server. Then when the result from the server comes back, the client's done. And this is why meter, app, meter apps feel so snappy, because we did all the work already. We predicted what was going to happen. And only if something went wrong do we have to undo the changes that we made. And, and Meteor takes care of that part, too. So you don't have to actually go undo the changes from the method. Meteor saves the original, the original state before it runs the client stub and restores it afterwards. All right. So we have used a Meteor method. That's a really fundamental building block, is this RPC mechanism inside Meteor. Um, one thing you might have heard about Meteor is that you can use the database API on both the client and the server, and that's totally insecure. So the first part of that sentence is true. The second part is false. So I'm going to add, I'm going to add a new feature here, which is um, adding a new talk into the, into the list. So let's add a new template, and this is just going to have a form inside it. And we're just going to use the database API directly to insert this new talk. So it takes a title and a speaker. And boy, those kids must be having a lot of fun. Um, OK. OK, so we have a form, pretty basic. Let's write an event handler for it. So down in our client code, we're going to write an event for our new, new talk template. And what this is going to do is just call insert, just like you would from a Mongo shell or from server-side code. And it's just going to grab the values out of the form. And we can also just pass a callback. Um, so this is a callback that gets run after the, the server has actually acknowledged the insert. And what we'll do is that we say, if there's no error, we'll just clear the form values. So if we run this right now, it shouldn't work. That's because this collection is completely locked down. You can't do any writes to it from the client, except if you call a method. So let me just show you that we have our form down here. And it didn't work. And in fact, if you go look in the console, which is OK, if we do, if we do this again, uh, maybe it doesn't print the error. OK, I thought it was going to say access denied. But the point is that it doesn't, it doesn't let us insert anything that, um, that, 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 that it doesn't let us insert anything right now. And what we're going to do is write a rule that allows us to insert the particular things that clients should be able to insert. So in our server code, we're going to write an allow rule. And this is a rule that takes the user ID of the, of, the client, the, of the client who's doing the insert, and it takes the document that the client wants to insert. And if it returns true, the insert will be allowed. If it returns false, the insert will be denied. So just for a toy example, we'll just say, you can insert any talk you want as long as it has votes zero. 
So now, I believe that this should work. So if I put a new talk here, it inserts here and here. And it's allowed only because we passed that insert check. And just to prove to you that that check is working, if we go um, change this to be a bajillion, then we should not be able to add a new talk. Yeah. So that's how an allow rule works. You can also write deny rules, and you can write these rules for, for inserts, updates, any, any operation. So when people say that Meteor isn't secure, what they're talking about is a default prototyping method, uh, a, a, a mode of, for prototyping that we have, where you can write, read and write any, any collection arbitrarily from the client. But as soon as you go out of that prototyping, prototyping mode, you have to use a method or write allow and deny rules to specify what parts of the API the clients can use. So we have a pretty cool app now, and in not very much code. Um, one last thing I want to show you is uh, that Meteor, we try, to, we try to make it really easy for developers to build the kind of real-time, fast apps I was talking about. But part of that is also just making it easy to do things that everyone needs to do in every app and that are very easy to get wrong, like an account system. So we don't want everyone to have to write their own account system. Uh, that's, that's probably bad for security, and it's just a lot of wasted effort. So we have a couple packages, actually quite a few packages, that help you implement an account system in very little code. So the first thing we're going to do is add um, an accounts Google package to our app. So we're adding this package. This is, a, this is a core package. And it will allow users to sign in with their Google account using OAuth. We also have packages like accounts GitHub, accounts Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And there are other community-supported packages for other OAuth providers that we don't support in, in core. So I added Accounts Google. I'm going to add another package called Accounts UI. And this gives us an out-of-the-box UI for, for users to sign up and log in. OK, so we've added those packages. Now in my template, um, to get this UI, all I have to do is this. So this is a, this is a UI um, or a template helper that the Accounts UI package gives us. So after we've done that, we see this configure button. And this is just something you do once when you first deploy your app um, to get, the, to get the, OAuth, the OAuth configuration set up. Hmm, that did not. OK, so I have some, um, I have some credentials for this toy app. You just paste these into the configure dialog. And you get these from the, the Google API um, console. OK, so we save our configuration. Now we have this sign in button. Let me make it bigger again. Um, and now we can sign in with Google. So now I've signed in with my Google identity. It knows who I am. I could similarly add GitHub or Facebook login. There's also an accounts password package if you just want password-based authentication and you don't want to use OAuth. And one, the last thing I'll show you is that we can actually use this user ID to do, to do useful things. So if we go into our methods, we can say, um, if you're not logged in when you call this method, then you just get an error. So we can do that on our methods. Uh, we can do that in our allow rule also. So here we only want to return, return true to allow the insert if you're logged in. So now that I'm here, and I guess one more, one more thing we can do is actually hide the UI that you're not allowed to use if you are not logged in. So this is another, another template helper that the accounts UI package gives you, which is that you can just um, you can just call current user to see who's logged in, and we can hide the UI that we don't want the, the non-logged in users to see. So now I see the UI here, but over here where I'm logged out, I don't see the upvote buttons. And here I can upvote. Here, um, if I try to insert a new talk directly, 
Um, I'll get an access denied. So you might be wondering, what is going on at the network level? What is the actual messages being passed between the client and the server? And you can actually look at them. So this protocol is called DDP. There's a rough draft specification uh, in the Meteor repository. And it runs over SockJS. And in this browser, which supports WebSockets, it actually runs over WebSockets. And you can see these are the messages in DDP. So there's a connect message. Um, there's a login method that gets called. So all this accounts UI stuff, it's all implemented as methods, just like the upvote and downvote methods that I showed you. These are the subscription messages where the client's subscribing to data. Um, you can see when a method gets called, let me, let me do this to call a method. Uh, so you can see now a method gets called, the upvote method, and a result comes back from the server. This updated message is a message to tell the client when all the data changes that the method ran are, are sent to the client. So at this point, the Meteor client knows that now is the time when it can start figuring out if the things that it predicted to do during the method stub are actually the things that the server wanted it to do. OK, so I think that's about what I wanted to show you in the demo. Um, before I wrap up, there's just a couple of things I wanted to say about the future of Meteor. So I mentioned some of them already. Um, I'm really excited about, about um, op log tailing, which is going to, be, going to be a whole new level of scalability for Meteor apps. Um, the, current, the mechanism that we have in there right now has, has worked. It's gotten a lot. It's running a lot of production sites right now. But um, you know, it's, it, it is what it sounds like. And we're really excited about op log tailing to, to be a much more scalable mechanism. Um, there's another project going on, which is called Meteor UI. And that's a new rendering engine and front-end framework for Meteor. And uh, it's, it's a lot smarter about figuring out when to re-render things. And it's also much more interoperable with other non-Meteor code that might be running on your page. Both of these projects have preview releases out. So if you're playing around with Meteor, uh, you can check out the Meteor Talk Google group. And there are threads on there for the preview releases. You can try those out. Um, trying out a new Meteor release with your app is as easy as doing this. So if I want to roll back this app to 066, 066, I can just do this. And then when I run this app, it'll run with Meteor 066 instead of um, 0663, which is what it was on before. So those are two cool things to check out. One thing which is not publicly available yet, but it's the thing I've been spending most of my time on, is this distributed deployment environment called Galaxy. And this is going to be an application server that handles auto-scaling and monitoring, provisioning, um, all sorts of good things. And it's been a lot of fun to work on. We're, we're aiming to have some uh, release of all these things out by early 2014 with the Meteor 1.0 release. So I hope you learned something, whether you've seen Meteor before or whether this is the first time you've seen it. I've been having the time of my life working on it, so if you have any more questions about what's going on under the hood or how you can get started learning, uh, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Emily. We actually have time for a question or two. Anyone have any questions? Just raise your hands. All right, we have one over here. Uh, what, how does it work with um, you know other server side code? I mean, uh, I want to do like you know I want to send out emails, so I want to um, connect to make a TCP connection to another server. How do how do I do that? So there are a couple. Well, the specific um, one one other trick. So all right, I have a couple answers to that. Uh, the prerequisite for one of those answers is that. There's this tool you could use called Meteor Deploy, where you can deploy an app to our free hosting service that has absolutely no uptime guarantees, except like someone will get paged if it goes down, and it might be me. But we have no guarantees about it. But it's a great place to deploy your, your apps. And when you deploy them here, you actually get automatically provisioned with a, um, an email sending, uh, is it Mailgun? Is that the thing? Is that a thing? Mailgun? Sorry. OK. It doesn't matter. Mailgun? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, you automatically get an email sending API, which is built into the Meteor Core and which is automatically provisioned with a third party service when you deploy here. I don't think that's really the answer to your question, though. Um, there are a vari variety of ways. You can, drop in, you can drop in any NPM module. So in your, um, 
Oh, so now you can all go play with this and be brutal. Um, okay, that's live. Uh, okay, oh, but we need an API key. Okay, you can't be brutal yet. Anyway, okay, so in your server code, um, you can do something like, like what's your favorite NPM module? Um, Chance to coffee. Hmm? <laughs> Um, you can you can you can drop in any N npm module you want. Um, you can package any code that you want as a meteor package. There's not very much to that. You just need to make a single manifest file. Um, there is also the the biggest problem that people have, I think, is that meteor code all runs in fibers, and a lot of pure node code does not. Uh, so we provide some wrapper utilities to, for example, if you call a third party, a third party. Um, API and you pass it a callback, we give you a helper that wraps your callback in a fiber for you. So you don't really have to think about fibers all that much. Okay, and people are wondering if you could actually vote on that list. I hear oh. someone betting 10 bucks on Leo. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, let me put in. People are going to be very, people's feelings are going to get very hurt. It's not my fault. All right. It's all yours. <laughs> Again, that's talkjudge.meteor.com. Oh, it's not all yours. OK, I, I, will, I will set it up. And <laughs> I have to change the, because yeah, I set it up for localhost. I'll, I'll, I'll like put in the chat or something. All right, if anyone has any more questions, Emily's going to be going around. You can see Ron and Breaks later on.